just so happens to be the same term that you have the highest deficit didn't of any decrease president revenues. on record. Revenues went up. On revenues record. went highest up. Highest deficit of Quit any president that. on record. Donald J. Trump. I'm put those on signs, on posters, Quit. put you're, them on you're putting billboards. Out lies. He's the deficit president. Donald J. Trump is the deficit president. Can I can I finish my statement in response to what you just said? No, I'm a mean Democrat. We deplatform. Okay, so. How you been doing, man? Uh, fantastic. Busy, busy at work, busy with the family, busy trying to enjoy Montana and stream, of course, and it can't a be little that bit hard of... to enjoy Montana. It's a beautiful state. It, it is fantastic, and uh, CS2 is out, so I've been uh, playing a lot of CS2. It's CS2 major happening right now. I don't know if you watch esports, but the I Counter -Strike? certainly do. I'm... Oh yeah, you know I, I, I only like grand strategy games for esports. It's the only one where I'm like genuinely interested in all the strategy. Maybe I could get into it. I mean, like I, I like football because it's a family activity. I don't watch football alone. I watch it because the family's together. We get to cheer for the local. You know, get to cheer for the Redskins and such. Um, Whereas, you know, I can't Red do that. Skins, you racist. It's, it's I, I, I know I grew up in the D.C. area. It's the we grew up in a we called it a skins household. I understand why they changed the name. I just grew up with it. I'm used to it. I don't. I don't. Um, I don't know. I think it could have been something cooler than the commanders. Like, I feel like they could have gone a different angle. Just like, how about yeah. instead of like the Redskins, we call them the respectable native community. <laughs> I don't know. Just something that could have been, I think, in the same area. So it didn't make all of our old merch completely useless, yeah. you know? Yeah, right. No, I think it makes the old merch like valuable. But um, what, what do I know? No, but I think I, I know what you're saying, though, about like, OK, well, I'll watch football, you know, for, for this purpose. I think you're kind of like me and a lot of other folks that are probably interested in watching people like me and you which is we like to learn stuff like if i'm gonna watch something like i'm gonna try to i'm gonna watch a documentary on youtube i'm gonna read the wall street if i'm like sitting there just on my phone like i'm gonna read the wall street journal i'm gonna watch a documentary on youtube like you know that's the kind of t like i but make an exception for cs2 esports I, you know, I, my, my sport is boxing. I love boxing. I've loved boxing ever since uh, I got into it in high school. And that's the sport I actually pay attention to. I've got, I'm getting involved in sports gambling as a responsible, physically responsible adult and starting, starting to bet on the different matches. Uh, yeah, I got money on the Usyk uh, Fury fight. Of course, I bet on Usyk. I can't be in Ukraine and bite again, bet against Usyk. I feel like that'd nice. be sacrilege in a way. You got to be careful with the gambling thing. I, I took a continuing legal education seminar on addiction problems with lawyers and gambling um, can be uh, an actually an addictive thing that can cause problems. And it's crazy how everybody's gambling now, like the sports gambling has like blown up. It, DraftKings is gigantic now. I don't know how much money it's worth. Actually, let me Google how much money is DraftKings worth. DraftKings value. Because it's gotta he, be billions. Oh my God, twenty-one point five seven billion dollars. That's absurd. Oh yeah. my God, think how many mortgages are in there. How many people's homes are are in that? Oh my goodness, that is a lot of money. What was? Uh, but I gotta say, ninety-nine percent of gamblers quit before hitting the big. Good, good for them. No, that's good. <laughs> I can't stand gambling myself. Uh, I, I just hate the feeling of when you lose. So I just don't, I don't do it. I, I, my rule is just don't gamble m with money that you're not willing to see literally just burn up in flames. Uh, it's the type, like I have a limit. My limit I think is something like, uh, it's like a few hundred dollars. Like I'll put a few hundred dollars on a match within a four month period. That's my limit. So I got to bet it in the most eff effective way to get the most bang from a buck. And if I lose, it's whatever i'll survive but i'm not betting yeah, i would never bet like a thousand dollars on like a on anything like i couldn't imagine betting right. that much money on any anything period so this conversation um we kept putting it off a little bit we're gonna talk a few other times that it kept just scheduling didn't work um i forget what was the initial initiating uh thing that made us want to talk was it just the want to connect or was there uh, an initiating thing that made us want to talk originally uh was there like I a tweet or something? Because I know we go back. We, there might, there we was might have been a tweet or yeah. something. I don't remember either. Um, I just think it's cool just to catch up. Just we haven't ever had a one on one, really. Have we never? I'm sure good. we've had one on ones before, I think. No, maybe a couple times, but.
But I get you mean a heart to heart. You mean you want to get to know the family? I can't. I don't even know whose well, idea it was. I'm, Burns, I'm always down Burns to have a conversation. Family comes from the steel mills of Ohio. My grandfather worked in the steel mills and crash training pigs. Vietnam vet raised me as a good boy, a good old boy. There you go. You got the Dylan Burns backstory. <laughs> Now you know my is that is that a, is that true? No, my grandfather grew up on farms castrating pigs. Uh, he then worked in the steel mills. Uh, well, no, then he went to Vietnam as an underage soldier illegally. Fought in Vietnam for a few months. Um, really like deep, deep combat. Um, uh, and then they found out like you're underage, you cannot be doing this. And then they sent him to uh, it was Iwo Jima where he did the rest of his term on the beautiful island of Iwo Jima. I gotta say, compared to Vietnam. I would say that's a pretty, pretty decent deployment. Then he came back, worked in the steel mills. Chinese steel came in, moved to D.C., worked for the Washington Post in the printing machines. He print the newspapers. He did the mechanics. Then he did the job that he did for the rest of his life, Bureau of Engraving and Printing as a machinist, working on the machines that print the money. Yes. Yeah, my grandmother, they, he raised me. My grandmother did too. My grandmother was a cook for the Bureau, uh, not the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, that's my grandfather. She was a federal cook. She did uh, research on like cooking and what's the most effective diets for different animals, different diets for different humans, stuff like that. That's interesting. Cool. Yep. There, now you know my, my, fami- my immediate family lineage. You know, the people so that- who built Burns. Yeah, I mean, it kind of, it kind of, raises a question in my mind that that maybe maybe was the original thought for this conversation which is number one how how were you ever a democrat and then number two you're you're not you're not still a democrat and you're not you're not still supporting joe biden are you what joe biden that democrat joe biden no um uh how did i become a democrat my grandfather and my grandmother were democrats uh their whole life as far as i'm aware um i think they voted for Republicans on a few occasions, they're not like partisan Democrats. So there are occasions where they have voted for Republicans. In fact, I think that they voted for Trump the first time around and voted against him ever- the second time around. And they're going to vote against him ha- the third time around. Have you ever voted Republican? Have I ever voted Republican? No, I have not ever voted Republican. Um, I, th- I think wow. I, I voted independent once for a single candidate that I liked. So I am willing to break with party against the Democrat if necessary. It's just in Maryland... The Republicans that are representing my district or have tried to represent my district, they don't have a chance of winning ever in my district because it's just so blue. And so it, it I, I've never seen them try to appeal to us in a way because it feels like they're like they know it's a lost cause. So they're just trying to advocate for their values. And if they're a values based campaign and being a Republican, then they're not going to be able to make the appeals to me to win me over. I'm not inherently against voting for Republicans, but the party is is in an ideological position right now where I, there's just no way for me to vote for them. So I'm just I'm, I'm registered Democrat. I vote in the primary, try to have the biggest impact on the party that uh, I feel that I align with more, if not with perfectly. Right. But yeah, my, yep. my, my grandparents were big Democrats because they're both union and they're both public sector workers. So they work for a public sector union, which Democrats have, generally speaking, been more on the side of protecting public sector unions, where the Republican well, Party has been more against. I mean, some of them are, are quite against the idea of public sector unions to begin with. Well, right. I mean, and the and the the argument being is that union unions were originally designed to allow for labor of of profit for profit corporations, so that the the workers could have a negotiating power against management of for profit corporations. But in the public sector, you're not dealing with a for profit corporation as the employer. You're dealing with the government as the employer. You're dealing with the taxpayers who are paying the salaries. So to have a union then in place to to like negotiate against the taxpayer well, to negotiate against the government it doesn't it doesn't make sense in the same way it does where you got it's, a, a the company logic town, is, for example. the logic's different but i still advocate in favor of it um the first thing would be that the government can and does even if it doesn't feel like it all the time engage in cost saving measures that a lot of times workers are not happy with uh and sometimes and a lot of times it's like it's never the upper management stuff usually uh it's stuff that ends up stiffing workers more and so they feel that a lot of times the government could have different interests than those who work for them where the government might have an interest in getting a project done as quick as possible might have a project uh, have an interest in trying to make it as cost reductive as possible in some instances that's not true in all instances but in some instances that is true and that might be against the interests of the working people in those instances uh there's also uh instances where i would say that the the unions have gotten up and when they negotiate their different contracts or negotiate uh their different deals with the government 
movement, uh, they've been able to, in my experience, from my conversation with my grandparents, be able to get them really decent benefits. I think they have a, I think they have a position, and I think workers in any workplace should be able to have that type of an option. Um, I even, it's the, even one of the few things where I'm like, I'm not against, in principle, a police union. Um, I think that a police union, and you could make the argument that public sector unions would have to work differently than a normal private sector union, but the idea of taking away that type of worker representation, when you and I both agree that the government is not always working in the best interest of the people, and that if that is the case, then why would that not also be true for the federal employees who are the, you know, the cogs that keep the machine running? Okay, I, I, I'm going to respond to that, but first, Danabo reminded me in my chat that Danabo was the one that wanted us to talk. That makes sense. Remember that Danabo was in my stream telling me in my chat, telling me to like call you. And he was in your chat telling you to call me. That might've, that might've happened. I think he likes it when we interact. <laughs> yeah. But also thank you. Thank you for that Danabo. Um, I, I mean, I think you're right that like, yeah, of course the government is going to do stuff that workers don't want because of course the workers are going to say, Hey, I want a million dollar salary and I want all these benefits. So like, the fact that the government, you know, does stuff that the workers don't like is like, of course, that's going to happen. No, no dispute there. Um, I would just say that instead, of, I mean, instead of having these these unions that I frankly don't think are necessary, especially when you look at like when you take into account salaries of federal government workers plus benefits, it's actually it's actually over and above their private sector counterparts. And so here I am out here working in the private sector, grinding away um to, to to pay taxes that then go to pay other people doing the exact same job as me and making more than me off of my t it, so there there's that issue i would say the if 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 there is this huge problem that you, that you're talking about where workers but of the government are being uh, abused or misused in a way that would well, justify a union that's a political issue that ought to be addressed through the political well, system I, I would not, also not say through... that if you had a security guard at a mall and then someone said we don't got no crime at the mall we don't need a security guard then you're a security guard and then all of a sudden you have more crime because you no longer have the deterrent of the security guard. You no longer have this check on that. If you get rid of the unions for the public sector workers, while public sector workers on average do get treated better than private sector workers, I don't think the answer would be to make it so those public sector workers get a worse deal because they don't have their representation anymore. It would be to try to find representation for the private sector workers. Okay, here, the real solution, I, in my opinion, is, is to basically, I mean, I support Vivek Ramaswamy's plan to fire 75% of all federal employees. I, Man, I, I thought that, that plan was crazy, especially when he said he wanted to, what, he said he wanted to do it by like a raffle. So he wanted it to be like almost completely random, like everybody sticks their hand in like a hat and it just, not, not would it not be merit spaced at all? I, I would assume you would not agree exactly with this plan. You would agree that if you are choosing government employees to keep, you shouldn't just do it by like hat. You should do it based on merit, right? Well, that, that's funny. That's funny coming from a Democrat when the Democrats are, are passing these omnibus packages and CR packages that have absolutely zero analysis of anything individualized at all about our spending or what the federal government is doing. Yeah, and so you're really going to sit here. I mean, I mean, you're going to say, OK, well, well, we got to pay really, really close attention to each individual employee, whether we're going to fire, we're going to keep them. It's like at the same time, you're supporting a party that passes omnibus packages that has zero analysis of not not only just individual employees. I'm talking entire freaking cabinet level federal departments where there's zero hearings, zero analysis on the budget, how that money is being spent going anywhere. That's why you get these CRs and these omnibuses. That's why. We need well, to Congress clear, to stop doing I, that. And so <laughs> and so you can't micromanage the federal government at individual employee level at the same time as your carte blanche funding departments with no analysis of where the money's going. Um, I, I don't see the problem. I, I don't see really see the problem. I said I am in favor of merits based employment. And your counter was but the Democrats supported an omnibus bill. Was that the counter? Well, you, you're you're making a you're making my I don't disagree with uh, merit space. I've never I and and all the times I've listened you to the big promise when we talk. The which point is, is that I'm a ha ha oh. donk. You know, the point is once I wear it, that I got it, got it here somewhere. The point is Dylan. He on he on. That's the point. Is that <laughs> no? I agree with you. I agree with your point. 
Okay, I agree yeah. that if you're gonna if you're gonna fire seventy five percent of the employees, mm -hmm. you should be very very careful about which ones you fire and which ones you don't. But what my point is is that you're being inconsistent and hypocritical by pretending to care about that issue at the same time you're supporting these omnibus no, packages. No, I am well, number one. I, as somebody who has you know grew up in a in a household of a working who's raised by federal employees, not everybody who works for the federal government I think should be employed by the federal government. There are people like in every workplace. I'm sure you worked at law firms where you're like this guy's kind of he's, he's calling it and yes. all in all workplaces of this course. exists to a certain uh, extent but way uh, worse in the government though but way worse than the guy i mean uh, way I don't know. I way worse in the government it's, uh, is there any data on this that you know of because this is this is, is the stereotype but i don't want to just accept it because that's the stereotype well so dylan do you do you understand that the entire foundational system of our government and the, the founding ideas of the Constitution is premised on the idea that governments just end up getting bloated and and growing constantly with no and, and expanding their scope and power and that the entire foundation of our country is premised on that idea. And that's why we have enumerated powers and limited government. And so you're you're are you rejecting the literal one of the foundational ideas of, of why we have a Constitution that limits the federal government? Are you wait? I don't – I'm sorry. You took me on an adventure there, and I'm not really following. So you're saying that because I – okay. Explain so it to me like I'm two yeah, because sure. I'm really okay. – I, I don't see how these two things are connected at all. Okay, so you're 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 rejecting the notion, which is very well established. Well, no, that can there you please is... tell me my position first and then tell me how it's connected to me rejecting this notion? Yeah, your 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 position was is that there's not more – bloat in the well i'm saying that i don't than know it, than compared to that corporations when it, yeah i'm saying i don't know for sure because i know that's a stereotype but i haven't seen any data backing this up that in when it comes to federal employment that workers on average are lazier or they're doing less work they're phoning it in more they're able to get away with more what's the word quiet quitting i think is the is the okay. term is would referred you, to i just don't you, i just don't know of any evidence would, of it and okay. i'm not going to base would that just off of stereotypes because i know federal employees and most of the federal employees i know work tremendously hard do you, most most government I, employees I know are are lazy as well. F it might be because work, the type of federal hard. employees you work with. You see, I work in the I, I live in the D.C. area. Well, like if I go to meet those machinists well, at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing or, and working the CNC machines, right? Covered in oil, are those like lazy people, or is it the janitors well, that are lazy, or is it the people? Who no, are, it's all the people that are working the money from that home. Are lazy. It's all the people that are refusing to go into the – do you realize that most of our federal office buildings are empty because these bureaucrats are still sitting at home working from home? Meanwhile, the rest of us are having to go into the office and go into the job site? Yeah, they're lucky. That's why – like that, that's why in that's Congress – That's why I'm a streamer. The, Oh man, uh, yeah. I mean, if, like, honestly, if if you're not willing to accept the 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 very obvious proposition, well, no, I'm not. You can about... say it's obvious, but I grew up in the D.C. area. I grew up surrounded by feds. You cut me, I bleed. Fed, right? It's literally in my blood. Um, and I, cared, I'm then... not willing to accept, based on stereotype, the idea that feds, on average, are more lazy than than people who work in the private sector. No. Okay, fair enough. So, I mean, if you actually cared, if you actually cared about federal employees, you would be supporting would a that balanced that I, budget. I, oh, okay. Because the, right now, budget, you're, gotcha. you're support you're supporting budgets that are sending okay, our country before, into bankruptcy, and go, it's going to result in mass firings. Well, let's 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 extend to the balanced budget thing. Uh, let's let's start first with the seventy five percent of employees getting fired. So seventy five percent. Uh, how what 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 are we getting rid of? I mean, that's a big number of federal employees to lose. Right. I would what I what I would do is I would go go to Article one, Section eight of the United States Constitution, which lays out the enumerated powers of the go federal government, which includes mm -hmm. the military, post offices and post roads, immigration, um, bank bankruptcy laws, uh, the, the enumerated powers of Article one, Section eight. And basically, I'd, I'd eliminate you can easily eliminate 75 percent of the federal government if, if you just eliminated everything outside of the actual enumerated powers. And so that, that would mean real, you would you would just be like the military. Uh, basic judicial uh, like system, like you know, deciding the judicial federal courts. courts. Yep. Yep. Um, federal courts. Federal uh, courts. Federal police stuff like you know, Capitol Police Department stuff like that. Uh, so things like the there's Department really of not, Department of Energy. Really not that would be guard. Department of Oh, so we no federal. Okay, no fed cops. Then we don't have Capitol Police. Okay. So what what do we Correct. do in like a situation where people are like, man, I want to storm that Capitol again? What who's going to stop them?
if we don't have capital oh, the capital I mean, the, I, guess, I suppose the capital might be a unique situation because I would assume that the city of Washington, D.C. W- would be the appropriate entity to have, have a law enforcement. Yeah, but we would, maybe, we would maybe have to the have them take over the but policing, the idea, yeah. But, okay, so now, so now Democrats are in favor of this massive militarization of the p- federal police force where you what? got federal agents. Now you got federal agents walking around with badges and guns to? arresting people. You want f- a bunch of federal agents arresting people with badges and guns, and now you're so pro-law enforcement, you want all these federal, federal police? I have never been, I don't know what you mean. Wait, is it, uh, this is not, the lecture fan, can I just tell you, this is the main problem with, with talking to you sometimes. I feel like you're talking to this, yeah? When I talk to you, you're talking to this stuffed animal. Well, when I, if, this, if you're no, not this, a Democrat, wait, tell me you, if you're not a Democrat. This is the problem I have, lecture. Every time you talk about my position when I give a take, I could literally walk off screen and just hold this here and this would be it. It'd just be you versus the DNC. Not Dylan Burns, not Dylan Patrick Burns, uh, with the background I shared with you of the steel making and the and the Ohio pig castrating. You're talking to Nancy Pelosi plushy form, man. Like, like yes, Dude, in, my posi- in my opinion, look, as somebody who was, you know, there on Jan 6, I do believe that the Capitol should have police that stop people from storming the government and trying to take it over. I do think that is something that police should do. I've never held any position to the contrary. In fact, I would be of the position that at special events like th- that day, there should probably be even more police than usual. Like Trump had asked for, yeah, more National Guard troops, yep. Why did he wait, like, three hours to send or approve anything? When then you know he could have. What like he just sat there for like three hours. He was uh, Donald Donald. Are, and he knew it was happening serious? too. He did. Do you a- you actually think that Donald Trump is in control of, of capital security? I think that. Think um, I know that he, I would think it was Tucker Carlson, his son. It might have also been his daughter. Multiple of her family members, members of the House, senators, staffers, his personal cabinet were all trying to ca- contact him as he was locked in his room watching the TV broadcast of the Capitol riots. And he just sat there. And as it started, he was tweeting out, continuing to kind of egg him on at the start, continuing to be like, yeah, I mean, Mike Pence, come on. I mean, if you didn't want this to happen, right? He continued to egg it on for three hours as people were telling him to call him off, call him off, call him off, do something. And he did nothing. He didn't oh, spring okay. into action. He didn't lead as the president. Oh, OK. So when you, you, you so you you recognize that Nancy Pelosi was in it was in control of security at the Capitol. You're just talking about it. he should have tweeted out to, hey, stop rioting. I don't I don't really don't think that it's or what true did you that- want him to do? I don't think it's true that Nancy Pelosi was the main ar- uh, like architect of, of D.C. security that day. No. So who do, who do you think that controls security at the Capitol? Well, who is the, who was, if well, not the let Speaker me ask you a house. question. Why was it that the Maryland National Guard, headed by, of course, Larry Hogan, a Republican at the time, was not able to get approval to be sent up? Who Was it Nancy Pelosi denying them approval, or why were they not able to get approval? I have no clue because honestly, I don't care about January six all that much. Okay, well, I, we I don't really need to talk don't. about January so six. There's been fucking. We don't need to talk about January six right now. Anyway, it just kind of we just pivoted immediately into it. Well, yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but the, to address your earlier point, attacking me uh, personally for you know uh, well, allegedly a, arguing. Well, it's, it's a political uh, attack. <laughs> it's an attack. It's an attack on your politics. I'm not attacking you personally. <laughs> Well, but but I'm again, saying you're if, very. I'm if, saying you you go into super partisan mode anytime you talk to somebody. It's not talking to Dylan Burns. It's well, talking to the DNC. Well, uh, again, my response to that is: look, if if I'm arguing against a position that's a leftist Democrat position, and you don't support that position, just tell me. Just say, hey, hey, I don't agree with the Democrats okay, on well, that. Say, the- hey, I don't, I don't agree <laughs> with the left on that. Okay, I just mean, t- just when me you say, by the way, when you say, like, the Democrats are left-wing, the Democratic Party was never, as far as I'm aware, was, like, against cops being in D.C. or was against the idea of cops or was calling for, like, the abolition of police unions. There's, like, a few elected leaders in the same way that Marjorie Taylor Greene is one individual within the Republican caucus. And I could point to her and be like, wow, the RNC with the Jew space lasers and the, oh my goodness, she said that the the Ukrainians are harvesting baby organs to fund the war. But that would be dishonest because she's one person. It's about nine or 10 people in the Republic, Republican Congress who believe that type of shit. And, uh, and, and, yeah, and, if you, and if you argue against those statements of hers, I, w- I would simply say, I agree with you. I don't support those statements. And we can move on. Thanks for the raid, I mean, it's, it's, Okay. I just, it's, it's it just it feels like any time I express an opinion that's slightly contrary to that, it's like, oh, isn't that hypocritical? Because the DNC, and it's like, oh, 
okay? But that's the DNC. Well, again, I'm the D- okay. D-Y-L-A-N, D-Y-L-A-N, again. you know? <laughs> Right. So if, if that's my response and, and I say, well, your position is hypocritical because most Democrats believe this, and I'm assuming you do too, you can just tell me, no, I yeah, don't well, agree with the Democrats that's on the, that. That's, that's, that's the thing. The assumption is what I don't I dislike. Because if I say to you, for example, I, I'm, a, a, I'm a firearm owner. I own guns, right, as a Democrat. Now, if I said that and you were like, Dylan, that's hypocritical for you to own guns, the, I, the immediate assumption I would hear if I heard a Democrat say, yeah, I own guns, I'd be like, oh, I guess there are more pro-gun Democrat. That would be the assumption I would make because uh, I, and I would say that's that's absurd and that's hypocritical because the Democrat Party is trying to take guns from Americans. So you can't sit there and say I own guns and I support the right to own a gun and then oh by the way I also vote Democrat and I'm a Democrat. Do you, and I do you, the, no, that is, so you the, support if I was to take out the RNC platform, which I don't know if they even updated it for this year. I think it might still be the 2021. Um, if I was to take that out and I was to go line by line, you'd agree with everything in there? No, I wouldn't. Okay, no, I wouldn't. does that make you a hypocrite? No, it doesn't. Okay, well then, I'm, I'm there actually, you go. I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually a Republican, and work with the Republican Party because I want to be the one that gets to decide what's in the party platform and what it means to be a Republican. And I want to have influence. That's, on the I mean, party. that's the same I belief have I have about the, the Democratic Party. If they were to ask me to be Dylan, are you in favor of an AR-15 ban? My answer would be no. I'm not in favor of an AR-15 okay. ban. So, okay. So your main issue is with the assumption. That's fair. I, I mean, I don't like it when people assume things about me. But I will say this: it's just we all if look you, at each other as boxes, if, okay. man. Well, but but look, if if you if you have an understanding of what a traditional conservative believes about certain issues, and you assume that I I believe a, a certain belief about a certain t- issue because that's what almost all traditional conservatives agree with, I think, I'm not going to have a problem. I'm not going to have a problem with that the, assumption. Here here's the way. A best way to do it is just straight up ask instead of be like, it's hypocritical. Because if you were to ask and say, yeah, I'm pro regulate like I want to ban the AR-15, and you'd be like, ah, it is hypocritical. For and then you could go into it. But I think if I indicate that I'm one way, and then you call me hypocritical for indicating I'm one way, ask if I'm genuinely this first. I think if you do that with people, you'd be more uh, efficacious in your communication. Okay. I, I, I grant you that. But which one is more entertaining for Twitch? Uh... I don't know. What's your viewership like right now? <laughs> Lower than yours. Well, we're both that, we're both is, we're both below Hassan. But, so let's all strive to be Hassan. But the, yeah, that 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 has nothing to do with um with the entertainment level of the stream. That yeah, has to I understand. do with the, the demographics it is, of it Twitch is, viewers. I understand it's I understand it's entertaining. It's hard to understand when somebody's kind of like Oh yeah, Rachel man and when they're being like serious. It's I mean it can be kind of layers to it. Like it can be silly and serious at the same time. But I'm just saying I, that it I, does I, seem like every time you just set into like Democrat hunt mode, where are the donkeys, you know? That's what it feels like. Okay. And and I'm 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 hearing that. I'm hearing that and and what I'm hearing is you basically saying Man, lecture fan is so effective at this political argument. I don't like it. That's I don't a, like it that he's so effective. What? I got us. You caught me. You got you're me. You're just man. trying. You're you're trying to you're trying to change my tactics because you recognize how effective they are. Yeah, you know what? I think you got me. You think? I think. I think you got me, man. I but think no, you got you me can, in a corner you, here. You you can safely assume like if I'm saying something that comes off as like a complete asshole statement, you can safely assume I'm joking. Got you. So, have you ever said anything serious? Yes. <laughs> I'm just fucking with you. Okay. No. Uh, remember, remember who 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 used to say that I was a I was playing a character all the time. Was that Destiny? I or? think that, yeah. Destiny Destiny couldn't. I think Destiny couldn't believe you were real if I remember correctly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And that he's not the only one either. But uh, everybody that's watched my st- stream and anybody that frankly that knows. You know, anybody that is a part of the 50 percent of Americans who are conservatives, um, you know, shouldn't be shocked or surprised at even a word I say. Um, I mean, I don't think they'd be shocked or surprised about it, but just because something isn't shocking or surprising, like I hear a lot of things all the time that I think are stupid. Like, um, like something I hear all the time is like, oh, we're just funding the slaughter in Ukraine as if if the Ukrainians ran out of ammunition, the Russians would just all walk up to them and hug them. Like it doesn't get something said over and over. It doesn't necessarily mean it's it's like it might not be surprising, but it could just be kind of like a mantra that's repeated. Yeah. 
Man, your party's gone fucking crazy on foreign policy, huh? It's it's kind of going off the deep end when it, I mean, I understand like the fringes of it. I don't want to like hammer you over like I don't know if you saw. There were nine there was this legislation that passed to condemn the kidnapping of Ukrainian children. It wasn't sending aid. It wasn't like we were not going there's no money. It's like literally, literally like, hey, kidnapping children and saying you're Russian now. You don't need to see your parents anymore. That's bad. Nine Republicans voted against it. Now, of course, that's nine Republicans. That's not the majority of the party. But how the fuck is that even uh allowed when it comes to like the more like the uh, not and I don't I would say PR allowed almost. Like how is that not something that makes people skin crawl when those people walk into the room that they weren't willing to condemn the <laughs> kidnapping of Ukrainian children? How is that permitted? Oh no, I have no idea about that issue. Um I haven't heard their reasoning for voting against it. And but by the my, way, I'm not first, I'm not trying first, to get my, you on this. On. I understand wait, let me finish. I'm saying this, acknowledging this is something most people don't know about. It's I don't want to call it a niche issue, but most people don't know about this. I don't expect you to know about it. It's a niche issue because and my uh, where I was going with that is like I haven't heard their reasoning for voting against it. I haven't read the resolution. There may be there may be good reasons and arguments. There's that they voted there's against two it. parts. I, I really don't. I can tell you. But, the here, but here's can, the but here's okay. but here's the problem though. Okay. You're trying to make you're trying to make a big issue out of something that you admit readily admit is completely pointless and, and irrelevant. And so maybe they voted against it simply because. Uh, condemning kidnapping. Look, we're not. That's like that's like when you know Democrats go around demanding people condemn white supremacy and racism. It's like, dude, I'm not playing your stupid game. Nobody supports now, that. It's absurd. If like, you were to look at the list I'm not, of I'm not people, participating though, in your little game. I don't know if they're if it's the the people that are on it are like Andy Biggs. Marjorie Taylor Greene, these are people who have before repeated Russian state talking point. Like the thing that, and I said this earlier, and I repeat it all the time because I'm baffled she said that. Uh, and I, again, I don't want to focus too much on Marjorie, but we're talking about these nine people. Marjorie said that on TV that the Ukrainian government is harvesting the organs of, of Ukrainian children and using it to fund the war effort. She held some, I think it was some on the 19th of this month, she held some meeting about organ harvesting and i don't think she focused on this someone must have told her in the meantime that it's completely made up but that's the type of stuff that she was repeating and that's just straight from russian state tv and so if i'm seeing these legislators that are repeating those talking points and it's not just in the house i've seen ron johnson say things similar not exactly like that but say things that i know are not true and i'm like i've only heard that in one side of the one side of the propaganda sphere it, it is concerning to me that that type of stuff is being permitted and what was and look i'm not a huge fan of ronald reagan but it's almost as kind of baffling to see Reagan's party taken in by people who are sympathetic to the type of revanchism that Nixon warned about as before he died. Well, look, look, the Democrats are horrible on foreign policy. Look at what the world has turned into under Joe Biden. It's a disaster. Look at what's going on in the Middle East. Look what's going on in Eastern Europe. The, the Democrat foreign policy is way worse. And here's the deal, Dylan. Mm -hmm. The actual, the actual Trump foreign policy from 2016 or 2017 to 2021, um, what was nothing even remotely close to the isolationism that you are seeing in some parts of the the Republican Party. Um, and, and so, you know, if you want to attack the Republican Party's foreign policy, fine, but the Democrats aren't much better. And the reality is, is that Trump's actual policies are not in line with what you're what you're complaining about um, at all. Uh, it's, Donald Trump was, was very, very strong on foreign policy. Foot, never withdrew from Afghanistan. Fully supported Ukraine. Do Donald Trump. Remember, remember when Donald Trump uh, mm -hmm. sent weapons to Ukraine, and then all the all the Republicans and all the Trump supporters were criticizing Barack Obama because he sent blankets to Ukraine, and Trump actually started sending. How do those people sound right arms? now? Are they racing? Remember, to send remember aid to that? Ukraine? Remember that though? Remember that? I remember I, the blankets. Remember the blankets to Ukraine thing? By the way, my position has openly been that Barack Obama largely failed when it came to trying to dissuade the Russians from continuing. Um, and I, agree. I believe the same agree, thing about yeah. Trump, and I believe the same thing about early Biden. I believe all How three of them— How could you believe them, that about— But, but I, Putin wait, didn't what? invade anybody under Trump. Putin never invaded anybody under Trump. I don't believe Trump. that Trump— sent any signal that would have made the Russians believe that we cared enough about Ukraine to make them say it's not worth the investment, it's not worth the time, it's not worth the effort. I don't think okay, the so javelins were enough. No. So then so and then why the way, so then why because Putin about, invaded well, okay, one second. You said a lot of things. Let me let me say a few things. Well, I did. Okay, well, go you ahead. listed off a bunch of things. I don't even remember all the things you said. I'm just forgetting it. I'm just gonna move on. Pretending I, it even wasn't. Well, that. you've said like you've said like <laughs> ten things I want to respond to.
Uh, well, I did, did I even? I, God damn, you're you're tripping me up. You you know what? You are a linguistics master. I think you're you're finally showing your true professionalism. Um, uh, <laughs> no, go my, ahead. My, my my problem with um, I mean, I could go through all of them, but we're talking about Trump as to my issues. I could talk about Obama's weak handedness, and but when it came to Trump, the signals he sent were never that Ukraine mattered tremendously that much to him. In fact, I would say the signals he sent. When aid was approved for Ukraine under his administration, it was not approved because he championed it. It was approved because Congress wanted it to be passed. It reminds me of the Taiwan's Relations Act, almost Congress acting independent of the president to try to make the administration act because it was bipartisan, the idea of supporting Ukraine before recent, uh, I guess you could say, populist shifts. Now, uh, when that happened, Trump held the aid up and was like, I want this information on Joe Biden. Now, I don't want to get, into, I mean, a Hunter Biden. I don't want to get into the specifics of that. But if you're the Russians, put aside the Hunter Biden, whatever, who gives a fuck? If you're the Russians and you're seeing that military aid to this ally is being held up for information based on Hunter Biden. So does that say, oh, this is a priority. This is a priority for the Americans. It is a priority that's communicated when you hold up aid based upon wanting information about the son of your political opponent. Now, you could say that was justified. You could say whatever you want about it. But the signal that's sent there is it's not a priority and other things are prioritized over that, like dirt on his political opponent, information on his political opponent, whatever else could be more prioritized than that. I don't think he set the signals to discourage the Russians. And I think both Obama, Trump, and Biden, not sending those signals back to back to back, made them think that, well, I don't think there's really any American that'll stop us. Okay. And I I, I think that that, that whole... Uh... The, the the impeachment hoax number two or whatever that was with the Ukraine. And we don't need to talk about impeachment. Let's Ukraine. just talk about the Russia. No, I know. I know. No, that that's your shiny. You just brought that up as your shiny object. That that's your. My response is it was look, my one I know, statement. But yes. I I know that you I know that you got you care about that that issue a whole lot, and you think that that was like this huge important factor in in U.S. Russia relations. I'm telling you, it's not. The Russians don't give a shit about that. Really, they're they actually, don't. They're actually they're actually much more interested in wow. in other more in, more important signals like the fact that Donald Trump rebuilt the military and massively boosted U.S. military spending, like the fact that Donald Trump. Restarted would Trump upset missile Trump's uh, troops like, to Ukraine to fight the Russians, it? though. On, what what signals I, would that have met directly connected to Ukraine? That's all too vague. Can I can I finish my statement in response to what you just said? No, I'm a mean Democrat. We deplatform. Okay, so man, I, I you got you got to not. I just allowed you to complete your whole statement. Didn't interrupt at all, and then I say two sentences, and you're jumping in. But no, I think I think that what you're talking about as your that that's not the most important factor. Donald Trump absolutely sent much stronger signals in all sorts of other areas of his foreign policy, including dropping the Moab, taking out ISIS in Syria, uh, not withdrawing from Afghanistan, massively boosting military spending, um, all the Middle East peace deals, uh, requiring requiring NATO members to increase their military spending, and all. On and on and on. And guess what? The facts show that Russia, despite the fact that Russia had actually invaded Ukraine in 2014 mm -hmm. and was going to continue the invasion just as quickly and fast as they could, uh, despite that. There was actually four years there between 2017 and 2021 where that didn't happen. And then guess what? Do Joe Biden is in office for one year and mm -hmm. Putin sees that Joe Biden wants to cut military spending, that Joe Biden wants to bring this down, that Joe Biden is not going to pressure NATO countries to increase their military spending, uh, that Joe Biden has basically taken the use of military force off the table. Look at what Joe Biden did with the withdrawal of a Afghanistan. Look at the weakness on China. Look at the compare Trump's foreign policy on China, which is really the elephant in the room and a much bigger issue, to, let's be honest, compared to Russia anyway. And so, uh, look, you can talk about the little the little impeachment hoax against Trump and the perfect phone call to Ukraine, but that has nothing perfect to do with all of these with all of these much 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 bigger issues and and impacts on actual U.S. Russia relations. So, uh, yeah, well, the first thing I'll say is correlation is not equal causation. Uh, the fact that something happened while a president was in office doesn't mean that the president necessarily caused that thing. Um, I agree. Or, That's why I brought up a whole bunch of different circumstances. 
well, we can we can go into the different circumstances if you want. Like, I don't think the Moab had any impact on how Russia was determining determining to invade Ukraine. What would the message? Dude, they be? thought Trump was Wait, crazy. Me, they uh, thought uh, Trump would pull the flick. So I don't think the. I don't think that they even really thought that Trump would do that. I don't. I, I don't think any world power was was convinced of Bro, that. You, you guys I were I mean, saying I, we at the time Trump was crazy and Trump was going to drop I the do, nuke. No, and Trump look, was I stop. think out of all the presidents, Trump is the one that probably um, is the has the most reckless abandon out of all the presidential options. But there are so many Which other is good for foreign policy. That's not necessarily good. Having reckless abandon is not necessarily good for foreign policy. I don't know if you hear the words reckless abandon, you're like, whoa! That's not no, but a, being, I don't but, know. But but being unpredictable and having your enemies think that you might drop a nuke or you might invade or you might not military not necessarily operations. because if they do and then they get let's say the Russians think that Putin, Trump's generally crazy and then they with their decrepit nuclear systems get a signal that lo- nukes have been launched which has happened before and has caused close calls before and they think oh that guy's crazy enough to do it then they might be less likely to say wait like they had before so I do think that that type of reckless abandon could end up backfiring and there's reason why you might want caution when it comes to things like nuclear weapons I think we can both agree that caution when it comes to destroying the world is good can we get some agreement on hey, that before we go back to me responding sure, to what we any, said earlier? Okay. Sure. Fan- anything's, anything's possible. Yeah. F- fantastic. So as for the Moab, I don't think the Moab had any impact on how it uh, – determining how deterrence works is one of the biggest uh, questions in foreign policy. How – what signal one thing will send to one country, you might think it sends this signal, and because you didn't verbally communicate it or you fucked it up, it sends a totally different signal, or they do not care at all. We could make conclusions that if we leave Vietnam, and this is what Henry Kissinger thought and many other people thought that if we leave Vietnam it's going to cause a domino effect then this country then that country and then we'll lose deterrence and we'll lose this but we miscalculated that wasn't the case and the amount of cost for the amount of time and lives put in probably wasn't worth it we might disagree on that I don't know what your view on the Vietnam War is um so considering that what way does the Moab being dropped make the Russians think that this shows that the Americans are more dedicated to Ukraine? I'm, I don't need to just say, oh, Trump's crazy, because Trump, if he's crazy, he'll still only be crazy about things he cares about. And so if he doesn't really care about Ukraine all that much, or the Russians think that, if the Russians just think that, then that's how they're going to view our interests. If they think Trump isn't interested, well, then that's America's interest. That's what they're going to do. So I don't I don't think that the Moab or these actions in the Middle East or any of these things deterred the Russians from invading Afghanistan particularly at all. If you if you believe otherwise, I'd love to hear the argument as to how the Moab uh, kept the Russians back. Sure, sure, I could. But you, you just you just said that it's almost impossible to tell what deters and what doesn't when it comes to foreign policy. And then you said, oh, this didn't deter. I mean, I, I so what I said, is it? So let me let me be clear. I cannot tell you with 100% certainty that anything didn't deter. Like if Biden came out tomorrow and said, I will do this, I will, I will put Xi Jinping on a pike. Like I have no clue. You, there's no mathematical equation I can enter to figure that out. You have to right, okay. try to read circumstantial right. evidence and see like, oh, right. why would the Russians care about Moab and Afghanistan in here? Because yes. I think it could be easy for the Russians to think he dropped the Moab for the same reason that Henry Kissinger engaged in the secret bombing campaign of Laos and Cambodia to try to increase his leverage going into negotiations with the Taliban, which is what Trump publicly stated. The Russians could see that and say, this has nothing to do with us. This has nothing to do with Ukraine. This has nothing to do with how we're acting over here. Now, you could say that, oh, it still builds some level of credibility, but I don't think that that would be enough to dissuade the Russians from invading uh, Ukraine, considering what they say their interests are. Okay, so then why did why did they wait four years while Trump was in office then? Tell us that. Why did they wait four years? Well, then, and then it, why did why did they immediately invade after Biden gets into well, office? We could ask the same question as to why didn't the Russians finish off Ukraine in 2014 when Obama we, was president? Why didn't we they could ask all sorts of we could ask all sorts of questions? I, yeah, I just well, asked you if, if you don't be, think it, it was Trump, it could be a, it could be a multitude of factors. I think 
it could possibly be that they didn't think they were ready at that time. It could possibly be that they were waiting to see, look for certain diplomatic signals and they didn't see them and they wanted to negotiate something and it didn't feel okay, like- so you don't maybe, know. For so example, know. maybe they thought they could have negotiated a deal in, in splicing up of Ukraine with Trump, but they didn't think they could negotiate a deal of splicing up Ukraine with Joe Biden. And so they thought a second Trump term would be a good time to address that when he doesn't have the threat of re-election. It's complete speculation as to why they invaded in this specific time period. But right, assuming okay. that it's because of who held the White House, I think is not only the pretty American centric, but we haven't found anything that I think substantially pushes okay, that come way. Come on. You you know you know that when it comes to foreign policy and world affairs, that American presidential elections are almost the single number one most determining factor about when countries take military action and when they don't and what they do diplomatically. That is the most important factor. The, the American president it determines all of that. And so you admit that you wouldn't you would just be simply speculating. You don't know why. And let I'm me, telling let you, me clear. Hold I on, hold on, hold on. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. I let don't agree with you I, I, at all. I, I, I think well, let me that's finish. probably one. Can I finish smaller this? factors in fact continue okay okay so again you just all right so you just you just i don't even I know rejected what I your saying. premise <laughs> i reject your premise i don't think that's the largest factor in determining when a nation attacks is american elections i think there's a very american-centric viewpoint okay i i okay well i would encourage you to maybe do a little bit more studying of history and, and pay attention wow. to when to when foreign okay. policy incidents arise really and, and so why why do they invade in 2022 then why not near an election? Because that that they they thought that it was a good time to do it because they figured that they could get it completed and done with a weak president like Biden in office. They thought it'd be quick and easy that Biden would be too weak to do anything and it'd be done and over with. And then it wouldn't be a factor in the 2024 elections. In fact, the Russians are very disappointed that the Ukraine I, issue is you still want out my there. Honest, as, as you want my honest opinion? Do you want my honest opinion? I believe that no matter who was in that White House, the Russians believe their plan was almost foolproof. I think that they were so arrogant about how the war they were going to go. Remember, the war was supposed to end in a week. What could have Trump or Biden have done in a week without direct combat with Russian troops to have stopped the Russian army if the Ukrainian army was genuinely going to collapse in a week? Nothing. Okay. There was nothing we could yeah, do. Deterrence. Absolutely. Tons. Okay. What, okay. Give me, so, give me, okay, a, give so me you, a game plan. Commander, Commander Lecture. Okay. What do we do? We so got the think, bombers ready. So you, you think you think that the, the that that Trump increasing military spending, that Trump demanding NATO increase military spending, the drop in the Moab, I didn't even mention, didn't even mention taking out taking out Kassam. T hold on, hold on. You didn't no. you didn't. I didn't even mention the 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 strike on Kassam Soleimani. Didn't even mention the aggressive actions of the U.S. Navy in the South China Sea. Didn't mention any of that stuff. But uh, so it's like. Um, Why would you any gotta of look these at, things? You got to look at all of. Okay. You got to look at all. Of, so he, here's the thing, Dylan. Nobody okay. gave a flying f about Ukraine until February 2022. And so you're like, oh, do you think the do you think the Russians thought that? Oh yeah, Donald Trump is personally yeah, real interested in Ukraine. Of course not. Everybody knows. Nobody gives a crap about Ukraine, including Donald Trump. Donald Trump never. Nobody's ever heard of Ukraine. And so you're like, oh well, what specifically did Trump do to? Show that Donald Trump was really, really, really focused on Ukraine. Nothing, dude, because nobody gives a crap about Ukraine. And nobody did until the invasion happened. I agree. So look at other, I agree. I look agree at with you. Trump did nothing on Ukraine. We agree. He did nothing to other indicate to the Russians. He other did than nothing. prevent the invasion. He How prevented the invasion that, by saying by, by indicating he doesn't care. Wow. Look, you, I, we had I'm a sorry, president man. that prevented the invasion of you, Ukraine and you pretend to care about Ukraine and you're going to prevent the event. You Trump. made him into a little Superman. He do little super Trump. He was on the border. Right, you uh, can't even stop. Talk. Halt. I can't. I, I, on, so apparently man. you don't care. Uh, apparently you're not even happy that Donald Trump was able to keep Ukraine a sovereign country. Except no, the I'm Ukraine. not yeah, happy. Which, I'm spiteful. Which, by the way. Which, by the way, the they lost Crimea under another Democrat president. Oh, the fucking Democrats, just like them. Don't you agree? I, I mean, I, I just yeah, find brother. it I just find it disingenuous for you to for you to like just dismiss the fact that Donald Dog, that that you, that, you that, that that Ukraine's sovereignty was kept maintained for all four years of Trump presidency. And you just dismiss it, say fuck it, ah, but then you also say, oh, we gotta okay, really well, care under, about this. Well, under this logic, then okay. 
Well, Jimmy Carter was able to dissuade Saddam from invading different countries in the Middle East then because he was president and Saddam didn't invade other countries. Hey, how could he? You, what, you're going to say he was weak? We just have, he yeah, stopped we Saddam. Just have what do you mean? Come on. Well, I, have over, Saddam. I, have, I have overwhelming Strong evidence to Jimmy. the contrary, something you don't have. Okay. What did Jimmy Carter do that would have uh, encouraged Saddam? What, why, 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 why wouldn't it have been Jimmy Carter then? Tell, tell me about Jimmy. Tell me about your evidence that Saddam thought Jimmy Carter was weak. Yeah, and, and would have oh, rolled him over. Goodness. Yeah, he said he had contrary bro, evidence. Bro, bro, the Jimmy Carter foreign policy was known to be the one of the weakest, worst ever foreign policies. Okay, of all so time. why didn't he was, why didn't Saddam invade? Why didn't Saddam invade during the Carter presidency? Yeah, why not? Was it because um, there were other factors more important? Than the presidential election or who was president at that particular time that could have determined whether they took a military invasion? Well, well, but th there's a difference there because Saddam hadn't invaded a country and then stopped invading that country for four years while there was somebody. And then immediately once the Democrat come, then continue the I agree the that the circumstances so aren't different. the exact same. Yes, I agree that this isn't the Russian invasion of Ukraine I'm asking you about. I'm asking you about Saddam Hussein and Jimmy Carter. I agree with that. Can we go back to, I asked you, and I don't need you to give me the most specific plan in the world. But what I'm saying is if Ukraine was on the brink of collapse as the Russians thought, Thought, then there's not many, if any, diplomatic options that the Americans have outside of the threat of full-blown nuclear retaliation or direct military involvement. And Donald Trump, being a generally populist guy who's not very favorable looking towards the idea of deploying troops in the Middle East and had openly floated in meetings the idea of pulling out of NATO, saying, creating uncertainty about these types of defense commitments, I don't think that that policy made the right think you know what if we go in there trump's just so crazy we're gonna have marines landing okay. in sevastopol do you do you do you, you do you do realize that the reason trump threatened to pull out of nato was as a way to encourage europe to increase their defense spending to increase the aware. military okay so that is a pro nato alliance action not necessarily. I mean, if you yes, deliver, trying if you, to increase, let me ask you a question. NATO wait, 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 wait. If I say this alliance, I want you to dedicate more to this alliance, and they just say, no, fuck you, then what do you do? We, you have to pull out, don't you? No, don't you? Not if it's not, okay, not if, it's, so not if you're fan. bluffing. Not if so you're bluffing. Not if you're so, bluffing. And guess what? Well, you're wait, no, lecture their fan. NATO lecture spirit. fan. If they were, if you were bluffing, and then they just say no, and then they don't do anything, what does that do to Trump's credibility? It hurts it. Yeah, it hurts it. Is, is that not bad? Well, bro, we know what happened. Trump threatened it, and then guess what? Europe increased their NATO spending. So you're talking about wait, hypotheticals that didn't okay. happen. <laughs> Let's be clear. The reason they increased their NATO spending. How are you upset about that? Because How are you mad about I'm not that? upset about them increasing their NATO spending. I'm just, I don't think Trump's the reason they increased their NATO spending. He failed to implement that. Okay, why Why did all the European countries increase their NATO spending because under Russia Trump? Because Russia invaded Ukraine. That's why they increased their NATO spending. We had, I think it was they like They had eight, increased it let me under, let me, No, no, no. That. It's not even comparable, though. Before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there were eight out of 31 NATO countries that hit the 2% threshold. After, it's 18 out of 31 countries. By the end of this year, it's going to be over 20. Yes, I do think the Russian invasion of Ukraine was the main motivating factor. Great. I'm okay. I'm sure they did increase it even more once. But no, I just uh, they, I just the don't, invasion happened. Like we can move over. To, you said China was 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 a uh, more important. We can move over to that in a in a little bit. But I I just I just my position is not the Democrats would have been so much more amazing on Ukraine. My position is that Ukraine has been a bipartisan failure. That's my position. It has been a failure of both Democrats, Republicans, and what I would say is the foreign policy establishment in Washington who expected the Ukrainians to crumble upon first impact, that many of them did not listen to those who helped train Ukrainian forces in the last eight years, the developments they had made, and they had not calculated for that. And therefore, since they didn't know what was going to happen for that first month, aid to Ukraine was really weird. They were talking about MiGs and talking about tanks, but we were scared that the Russians would take everything over. And then it would look like, oh, look, the Taliban has all their guns. Oh, the Russians have all these American tanks and jets and all this. And it would be not only uh, a diplomatic catastrophe, humanitarian catastrophe, but it'd just be plain humiliating. And so I don't think 
that in a week's time, Trump listening to the same national intelligence experts is going to make the conclusion massively increase aid to Ukraine at the start of the war. I don't think he's going to do anything that would have dissuade the Russians as they're getting ready to invade to stop them. Outside of what? Direct nuclear threat? Direct troops on the ground? If the Russians think Ukraine will fall in a week, what could he have done? Okay, do you know what Trump's foreign policy on Ukraine is right now? I'm I'm generally familiar. Yeah, it's the loan, and he wants to loan the aid uh, combined with trying to bring them to the negotiating table. Okay, and do you know what his, his strategy is to bring Russia or, to the well, negotiating Well, it depends, table? because I don't really know, because Orban said after a meeting with him, this plan is not to give a penny to the Ukrainians to force them to negotiate. Okay, so so you're not are you, I guess you're not aware then of Trump's foreign policy with respect to Russia where he has said to Russia that once I become president that Russia better make a deal otherwise Donald Trump is going to double the military aid Oh to no, Ukraine. I was familiar and with that. that. I, I that, remember that. That was said like okay, a, yeah. like a year or a half ago I think. I that, that's I the remember, type of, I would that's the type of aggressive this. foreign policy, strong foreign policy that actually gets results. You have to admit Joe Biden's foreign policy is a complete fail. But on, wait, on to Ukraine. be clear, you just, admit, you just said earlier that that thing was like bluffing, right? Or like that Trump wouldn't have actually pulled out of NATO. That's all just posturing really. So would he double? Would he, would who double? Would he double or is that just bluffing and posturing too? Because if he says, I'll double, it gets in there, and then the Russians do reject it because the Russians say, we want Dnipro, we want Kharkiv, we want Odessa, we want these other locations, uh, we want to annex all occupied territory. The Ukrainians say, no, they don't want the Trump deal. Then will he actually double? Do you think he'll do that? I'm, I'm sorry. I was getting distracted. I, I apologize. Do you, do you think Trump distracted. would actually double? Because, I mean, if he was bluffing about the NATO thing, how do we know he's not bluffing about this thing? Well, well, I mean, okay. Here's the thing about for, Trump foreign policy. Definitely Reagan considering who's surrounding is, him right now, like it, Tulsi Gabbard types. Like these are not people who are energetic about supporting Ukraine. Tulsi Gabbard is a Democrat. She's Tulsi not supporting, Gabbard, Steve Bannon. Well, no, Tulsi Gabbard Trump. is trying to posture for the Trump's VP right she now. She has no chance. She's a Democrat. She has, I think she just she's registered not, as. I think she registered as Republican very recently. No, she's a, Demo, she's I'm a Democrat. I'm not. I'm not, not kidding. I'm lit. I promise you. Look it up after. Doesn't. But, but here's, so here's Tulsi the thing, Gabbard. Dylan. Then we can talk about Steve Bannon. We can talk about any of the other people in his immediate circle who are much more leaning towards the idea of you know jostle the Ukrainians into accepting a unsatisfactory deal. Well, that's all. That all depends on your definition of an unsatisfactory deal. Here's the thing, though, about the bluff. In your question on the bluff, is when you have a when you have a foreign policy of peace through strength, which involves a massive military spending, very very aggressive military threats, uh, mm -hmm. demanding Europe demanding Europe increase its military spending, uh, uh, striking and, and assassinating Iranian terrorists all across the Middle East, dropping Moabs, all all of that stuff. Is some of it is a, a, a bluff, and especially when, when it comes to the ultimate issue of actual taking military action. And here's the deal. When you have a foreign policy where your opponents believe that, wow, if I do something that the United States or its allies don't want me to do, the United States may actually launch military action against me, and they just massively increased their military spending, and they rebuilt their military under Trump, et cetera. Then guess what? You don't actually have to end up taking the military action because peace through strength works because it's deterrence because you've got a massive military, so you never have to use it because everybody's too scared to mess with you. That's how it works. And so whether it's, the bl whether it's bluffing or not never, never ends up mattering because the foreign policy is effective, and so you never have to test it. Because you get your results without actually having to follow through on any of your actual threats, whether it's military or otherwise. I still don't see how either increasing the military budget and or the Moab or any of these things that you're saying that the posturing would put the Russians in a position where they would feel that they're not able to do this operation. Like, how does the Moab or the willingness to introduce the Moab change what okay. they think would be essentially a one week okay. operation? Well, I'll, 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 I'll answer that by saying I've explained a whole 15 or 20 different things of circumstances that I think goes into Russia's analysis on whether to invade Ukraine. You saying okay, those, those don't thing. matter. So I'm going to ask well, you, what well, does, okay. what did Russia, me, what, me, was, what was Russia problem, looking though. at? What? What With respect to you, the U.S. and the U.S. foreign policy and U.S. actions, what factors was Russia looking at to determine when to invade Ukraine, if none of the ones that I mentioned, which you seem to think are irrelevant, even though they're well, most, the most important foreign again, policy actions of the I, Trump I say presidency. This, and I say this with all genuineness, that, of course, no one can say 
hundred percent. This is what Putin was thinking, but I would lean towards the idea that number one, Vladimir Putin was probably not happy with the fact, or uh, if he was getting any reports that were semi-accurate. Again, we don't know what reports you're receiving that the Ukrainian armed forces has obviously improved since 2014. The performance, I think, is an example of the fact that they've improved. If this was the same army they had in 2014, then the whole country would have collapsed. They wouldn't have been able to hold them back, even with the militia. It just wouldn't have been possible. Uh, but I think those improvements might be a reason to intervene, because if the Ukrainian army continues to improve, then it means this type of operation five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years down the line is only going to be that much more difficult. Vladimir Putin is 70 now, I think. 70. So he's old. Point is, he's old. He's getting up there in age. I forget which term this is, but he just won another election. Landslide, by the way. Can I say? People love him. Everybody came out for him. Everybody. And no one for anyone else, apparently. I don't know why. But So you're he, an election denier. Okay. I am an election denier. I deny the results of the Russian election. But no, the... I think that part of it could be genuinely legacy building. He's nearing the end of his life. The Ukraine war has been a project he's been engaged in for about eight to 10 years. And that's only if you include the war itself and not the Euromaidan protest movement before, the spy operations, everything before. This is a long-term project. He's nearing, to be blunt, possibly the end of his life. And so a combination of the Ukrainians improving the military cap capacity, uh, him getting older and wanting to cement his legacy as this great leader of Russia, uh, and his personal ideology about Ukraine, but that's that could be whenever. That doesn't have to necessarily be now or tomorrow. But I think those two factors would be the things I would point to as my guesses. Okay. Well, if, if that was one of the factors, that would actually suggest an earlier invasion because after 2014, NATO and the U.S. and other countries and allies and whatever started helping train and arm Ukrainian troops. So if, if Russia was looking at the status of the Ukrainian military, uh, that would suggest they should have pushed the invasion forward sooner because in, b between 2014 and 2022, that depends, was an entire time period of when they were building up. It depends on how they see the diplomacy, because if they view it like at, at earlier on during this crisis, during the Merkel era, when Merkel's negotiating with them, and I don't know what you think of Angela Merkel's and how she dealt with the Russians, but if you're Vladimir Putin and you're having to talk to Angela Merkel, you might think that they might just give you everything you want, even if they don't do it directly, they might look the other way in the interests of business. And so he might have been of the opinion before, definitely maybe with Trump in office, somebody that he's a, very willing to sit down and talk with, and I would say much further friendlier with than Joe Biden, he might be willing to cut a deal. And so if he sees the option to cut a deal going out the door, the Ukrainians improving and himself getting older, I think these crossroads kind of come together. But this is a guess. This is I, I don't I don't have the documents. Fair enough. But I don't I mean, I don't know why you're even attacking me on, on the Ukraine issue. It's like I'm I'm not a I'm not an isolationist. I'm not a, I, I don't I'm not attacking you policy. on it. I was more I, I think we just started talking about the RNC. Um but now you understand how I feel. Well, right, but I'm I'm responding and telling you like I'm not a part of the isolationist. So you support Ukraine or the libertarian Yes, I hope Ukraine wins the war with Russia. Absolutely. Do you want to uh, send weapons and like aid to Ukraine? Absolutely. Oh, dope. Or are you like a, a send a little bit, send a decent amount to just get it? I'm a so position. Here's the thing. Here, my position is here. send them the gear sooner so the war can be over sooner. Because this is a this is a numbers question. Like once they run out of tanks and BMPs and stuff, then you know they, them their uh, what to negotiate is going to increase. But the longer you put that off, then the longer this war could drag on. And as long as the Russian public is apathetic, then you have this going on for years and years and years. I don't think it's, this is costing us tremendously much. So I don't think that would be necessarily catastrophic for the United States. I think it'd be much worse for the two countries actually fighting the war, but I'd rather it for humanitarian reasons, honestly, in large part, would rather the war end sooner rather than later. Look, my, my analysis on it is, uh, I mean, again, it, honestly, it's a constitutional analysis. I go back to what's the prop, proper role of the federal government. The only one, literally one of the only reasons we even have a federal government is for foreign policy and, and military. Um, and so then you look at you look at the actual budget of the, the federal government. The federal government's wasting seven trillion dollars a year on welfare programs and other other. Hey, IRI, spending. thank you for the raid. We're, we're streaming with uh, IRI's 
uh i would say this this guy's a little up there for iri i would say you know maybe one day iri can come on to talk to a, a heavyweight like this but uh i think it actually i think iri once told me his favorite streamer of all time was lecture fan so for iri streamers go check this guy out okay he's 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 something else so we've got a fed we've got a federal government literally wasting seven trillion dollars a year on unconstitutional sort of wasteful fraudulent scam artist type spending with you know scam on all sorts of well welfare all this other crap and so you look at a hundred billion to Ukraine when you look at a hundred billion to Ukraine that's a part of the the number one reason we have the federal government foreign policy and military and it's a hundred billion to to achieve actual legitimate constitutional objectives of the federal government compared to seven trillion dollars in wasteful welfare type unconstitutional spending it's like it's like dude if you want to if you want to save money like don't cut a hundred billion to, to ukraine which is proper constitutional spending put the seven trillion dollars of unconstitutional waste and fraud and abuse out of the federal government you know, so i it's respect like, this it's a drop in the intellectually i don't respect it politically because we disagree probably on things like i don't know child tax credit or stuff like we probably find that well i don't know about child tax credit specifically this is a tax credit and i do know republicans that like tax credits like that but you don't like child tax credit i don't I don't like tax credits that go to people that don't pay taxes. No, I don't. Okay, well, I like tax credit for families. I, I'm a pro-family guy. If you're an anti-family guy, I think that's okay. Bro, that, the, the way that that, that, that child, do you realize the way <laughs> no, that that wait, child wait, tax was, credit is set up is, is, I, just, I, was, I promise it's to God. It's a Trojan I, horse. I promise to God. It's a Trojan horse for you. I promise to God. No, but it, fuck it with I know, you. but but do you, you realize it's a Trojan horse for universal basic income, right? Um for i mean for families maybe if it's a child tax credit then it would be a universal in be basic income for fa if anything if you're a really like pro family they... guy i would imagine that this would be the type of thing to try to encourage you know people maybe bringing about families right so i agree that actually the federal government should encourage bringing about families i just don't think uh, a trojan horse to bring in ubi is the way to do it and i understand you don't have children correct no, I don't have I don't have children. Or okay, so I you don't, don't know. So you don't know. <laughs> okay, so you don't you didn't you didn't have a personal experience with how the how the child tax credit was administered when it was expanded under the Biden spending programs. But what happened was is all of a sudden, just out of the blue, boom, you start getting deposits into your checking account from the U.S. Treasury monthly. That and is, so that's how it was administered, and it well, was you said it, all it was of a sudden, but it was after the legislation was passed. That's how it. Yeah. But for most, but for most people that experienced it, it was like they checked their bank account and suddenly there's a deposit from the U.S. Yeah, a Treasury. lot of people didn't know it was coming, and people, uh, most of the people spent that money on essential goods and services. I think it was the, the numbers was 88 percent of it was spent on essential goods and services. Um, and it depends on how much you expand the definition. Like I would say, childcare would probably be in an area that would have covered like that. Um, I think like 12 to 10 percent was stuff on like movies and stuff like that. And so it seemed to be going towards what people needed during a time of economic crisis come, or around with COVID try to crawl ourselves out of what many people thought was going to be a recession and thank god wasn't a recession oh my goodness that's you, the last are, thing we need right now with so much division in this country is also economic catastrophe compounded on top of it are you are you okay with hundreds of billions of dollars of food stamp money being used to buy uh soda and chips uh uh you know i don't actually like it very much um Ooh, but, that's gonna that's gonna upset the left it just it depends it's a question hey, of, see, i asked you your position this mm -hmm. time as opposed to just yeah I, I appreciate that by the way i'd prefer it to be spent in certain areas but it's also a question of accessibility right like if all that's around the school where this where where you would go to to go buy something is just shit food it's a question of accessibility i'm not against uh, making it more restrictive as long as those options are made available but i'm but i would also for that compromise to make that compromise with republicans we'd also have to increase the the individual deposits people were getting for those stamps that would be my compromise wow. yeah because we've got so much money to spend yeah great idea inflation is not a problem maybe we didn't have federal such debt's not gigantic a problem. tax nope. credits for the ultra rich maybe we would have more money to spend to deal with our market wait, failures so, wait, wait so i feel the, like we got wait i'm sorry 10, before we get lost 10, in the sauce i think we were, we were going to talk about something that we got we pivoted off of it i was going to respond to something earlier and i and i forgot what it was do you remember you just you you just didn't like uh the, the my take on the child tax credit uh, it was something before the child tax credit ah whatever it is it is what it is hey eddie bombay I, I thanks threw, for the tier one I, I threw i threw you off just like you've thrown me off yeah it's okay i'm just trying to remember and i can't no it's all somebody right somebody in chat uh, might remind spending. me Oh, you were you were you were saying you were saying that like you respect my, my point intellectually. Oh, intellectually, in but not politically, because 
a lot of times I'll see people say, we don't need to spend this money on Ukraine. We got people here who are homeless. We got veterans who are this, this, that, and they'll come back and be like, okay, so should we spend it on a big public house? No, of course not. What are you ridiculous? And I'm like, oh, then what, the way you can, if you say this is not the job of the government, then why are you saying the government should stop doing what is clearly its job and start doing the thing? What It makes no sense to me. So when you say like, of course, like, I don't, well, if we didn't spend it, we'd just keep it. We just wouldn't spend the money, period. Not, I, I respect this more because it seems to be more consistent. Right, right, right. That's exactly Intellectually, what I, not that's politically, because I disagree. That, yeah, I mean, ex right. I mean, I I believe in balancing the federal budget with massive, massive spending cuts across the board, across all areas of the federal government, but... um I, yeah, I support military, some military amount of deficit spending. I think I think having a it depends on your inflation. It depends on your inflation. Depends on value in your money. But you got to keep it within range so it doesn't get out of control. Which the governments have never, ever in the history of the world, in the history of humanity, ever been able to do that. But I mean, they've been I able mean, to do it for decades. Good. Norway. What, what's wrong with Norway? Or what about other well, countries? I, it, it, yeah, it can, it can go on. It can go on for decades. But there's there it's never gone on forever, and you can't well, dispute that. Well, governments don't go on forever. <laughs> so you're right. I guess you're right. You're right by default, lecture. You, you have to agree with me on that. You I have, have to. I have, you know what? You won this debate, lecture. I you got me right. on that one. There, there has never, ever, ever been a government that's been able yeah. to continue deficit spending forever. That is true. That's it, never happened. That's it, true. It, it just, and frankly, it won't. It all has to come to an end. You can't keep increasing your debt forever. That's a that's a. By the way, there's also not a, a government that doesn't that has it not deficit spent forever. Right, which is why you have to have strict strict controls on the government and make sure that they're limited in their powers and that they're confined to a little box and that they don't get bloated. And by the way, governments the don't numbers. exist forever. So why should we get governments? Well, Everything's impermanent. I mean, that's fine to have things that are impermanent. Okay. That's all right. Got you. But I, you have, I thought you were memeing about the the deficit point of like it, it can't it cannot literally. I mean, I understand like like eventually the I government was partially collapse. Memeing. Yeah, I don't know how I didn't I don't know how to engage with it because I can't find the meme and where the like the truth is. Well, the, the the truth is is that we're actually approaching crisis levels of debt right now. I mean, the, just the interest on the debt is going to be over a trillion dollars. It's going to be in in a in I think like year next year, the year the the year after, it's going to exceed um, Medicare and Medicaid spending. Just interest on the debt. Um, so we're going we're going bankrupt. Um, and and Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid are are quickly headed to insolvency i mean and this isn't like oh and you I know mean, 30 years from now they'll be insolvent like no they're going to be insolvent in like five years like this is happening right now no i don't think this i think is, i think that's not i think that's an amount of i think you're gauging in some amount of alarmism there um uh i would say that when it comes to deficit spending uh, we are the world reserve currency, so we have a special amount of flexibility. And as long as we remain the world reserve currency, we can maintain that amount of flexibility. It is also true that governments can engage in a certain amount of deficit spending, period, as long as they control for their currency values and make sure that inflation isn't getting out of control and you keep it within inflation. There's a certain way you can manage a certain amount of deficit spending uh, in perpetuity, actually. Yes, but it depends on how it has to be within a certain percentage. It cannot be like 10 percent, twenty percent. It it has to be within a in a percentage. I will also throw out, and I do I do need to ask you this, and I'm asking your genuine opinion here. How do you if is this a major issue for you the the budget and the getting out of control? Yes, I think the federal debt is one of the most important issues. Yeah. Okay, if this is one of the most important issues, um, for you, then. Trump, you know, he did increase the deficit to record highs under his administration, and he said he was going to eliminate the deficit. He didn't. In fact, he increased it. He, and I don't even need to get into record highs. He increased it. And he did tax cuts that further increased it that he said were going to, through the economic growth that they would produce, would then counteract it. But that income, when it comes to tax income from increased economic activity, never arrived, and he was the president that expanded the deficit to record highs of any other president ever. And so if that's like a major issue for you, do you think he's going to approach that differently in a second term? I, I don't I don't think Trump would would approach it differently unless forced to by Congress. OK, so if that's a major, is this just like something you can look past because the other issues are so important? You realize or? you don't no, you, re, you realize I didn't support Trump in the primary, right? 
Uh, no, but I'm, I'm asking, that's why I'm asking this follow-up question. So is this something you can look past because there's other issues that matter so much to you, you're willing to look past the fact that Trump's a big spender? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No, I don't look past. In fact, in fact, you can go on my YouTube channel and find when, when, YouTube When I say look past, let me, let me clarify. Hold on, hold on, hold on, let me make okay. a point, though, okay. because, because I wanted to say this earlier anyway, but you can actually go on my YouTube channel and find videos from 2017 and it's my reaction video to Donald Trump's very first State of the Union address to Congress. And I made a video immediately after <laughs> Donald Trump finished his 2017 State of the Union address where I spent the entire time criticizing Donald Trump for not mentioning the federal deficit and the federal debt not once during his first State of the Union. And so absolutely it's not something I'm going to look past. I absolutely agree with you that that's a – we can criticize Donald Trump, of course, coming from Democrats – it's a little bit rich to hear criticisms of, of Trump on the on the deficit. But I, well, I've, trying, I've been trying to I've been well, I can as a Democrat, I I, I something that I, I I care much about upholding institutions. I care a lot about the United States being here when I'm gone. That's something that I want to help contribute to is making sure the republic lasts until I'm dead. And hopefully after. That's something I care about personally. I don't want to get into all, all the different parts of it, but deficit and making sure that's under control is part of making sure that you can continue that, make sure that your government's solvent and can take care of its people. And so it is something that I genuinely care about. I understand in certain circumstances like war or, you know, some gigantic natural disaster, um, Ottoman invasion, whatever, aliens, then we might have to like completely go out of that God. But I do care about it to, to uh, an extent, probably not to the same penny, I would call pe penny pinching extent as other people might, but I do care about it. Uh, I was asking this genuinely because I think you care about the deficit. And so if this is a major issue to you, I was just wondering why is it that you're willing to look, not look, when I said look past it, I don't mean you ignore it, but you're willing to bear it in order to vote for him. The same way that I'm willing to bear certain things about Joe Biden in order to vote for him. Like I would, I don't well, think I would be able. Yes. I mean, it, I don't it, know like, if it, I would be able to bear voting for Joe Biden if Joe Biden came out tomorrow and said, "Screw Ukraine, I don't want to." I, I think there's something like on a personal level, I might be so repulsed. I don't know if I would be uh, willing to do that because I'd feel like yeah, we engage in such sneaky yeah, behavior. I, you know what I mean? I I do know what you mean, and I I think people that refuse to vote for anybody because of one. I refuse petition. to vote for anybody, but true. you can you can you're in Montana, you can vote for whoever the fuck you want. It won't. It's not going to impact the outcome. No, I mean, I, I think the question's absurd because you're saying, okay, hey, if you if you care about the budget so much, and there's two choices for president, but I can't Biden. believe you'd vote for the you'd vote for the one that would have that is more likely to have less of a, a budget deficit than the other. I mean, of, more of, of course I'm going to vote for the guy that. Of, of course deficit. I'm going to vote for the guy that's a Republican who are trying to cut spending. Of course to be, I'm going to. I mean, clear, why wouldn't I? Joe Biden has less of a budget deficit than Trump did. He reduced the budget deficit. So if the, if the question is voting for that, the guy that, who has a less of a budget deficit, the answer would be vote for Joe Biden. Vote blue. I, I know that you, – look, you, I know that you can manipulate the statistics. What do you mean manipulate? That's just a fact. Uh, That's not a particular, manipulatable particular, statistic. Dude, it's like you're not you, – you, you, you just lied by omission because you failed to disclose to people okay. that the only, reason, the only reason that your little statistic is a statistic is because Congress passed the CARES Act in 2020 during the last year of Trump's presidency and blew out the deficit with the CARES Act that that's Trump not, did sign. That's it. not necessarily – And then, the, and then, and then it, that, drove the, that drove the deficit up to like 2 or $3 trillion for 2020, and then Joe Biden takes over in 2021 and 2022 and blows out the deficit. And then when that spending is over, it's like, oh. Oh, well, I guess clear, all of the all of the deficits down because all the COVID spending's over, and you're like, oh yeah, Joe Biden fixed it. But come on. Okay, number one, the deficit problem didn't start with COVID. The deficit problem was a problem for the entirety of Trump's presidency. There was not a moment during Trump's presidency where the deficit went away. Every second was deficit. Right. He didn't. He didn't you, take. A, he, let me let me finish. I let you, okay, you right, finish. Right, he didn't right, go right. out and start hacking away government agencies. He replaced it with people that were loyal to him. And if you look at his plan to go back this time, whether if you believe 2025 is just nonsense or not, whether you listen to him, it's not. We're going to get rid of the Department of Education. We're going to get rid of this department. We're going to that department it's we need to replace them with the non-swamp 
So it's a question of replacing it with people who are, in my interpretation, or loyal to him, or in your interpretation, maybe, loyal to, to, you know, fucking America and true values and not being partisan and whatever you might think it is, whatever. We have some disagreement there. But in none of these constructions of how he wants the federal government to work, do I see him taking out the hatches and going chop, 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 chop to all of these budgets. In fact, what I'm hearing is- Agree! Let me finish, let me finish. What I am hearing, though, is keeping it at the same size while also cutting taxes. And that is how you get situations like Venezuela. That is how you get situations where governments are just unable to maintain their budgets because they don't have the income. If you continue the lower taxes and when this budget deficit started to get out of control under Trump, it started with, you said it was with the CARES Act, I'd start with the budget, I would cut, start with the tax cuts. If you take out $850 billion of revenue, that's a lot of money to take out of the budget, whether you acknowledge it or not. I would love $850 billion. I don't know if you would want like 800 150 billion dollars but those cuts he started making then the cuts uh continued through his presidency he wants more cuts but he doesn't want to reduce the size of the budget i mean the side of you know the size of the uh, the government so he wants to continue to reduce income while continuing to keep expenditure at the same level what will that lead to it'll get worse all right all right can i go sure <laughs> all right um if your if your criticism of Trump is that boy he really should have cut the budget more or, or cut the deficit more, I agree. Well, I'm saying that that's more. that's against oh, let me, hold on, let me your values. Uh, I'm just clarifying. Let clarifying. Me, let me, okay, but if that, that I mean it's again it's just kind of uh, funny. But the the point the point is is that first of all I, you're wrong on the the economics and the numbers. Number one, I, it doesn't sound like you're familiar with the Laffer curve or the concept of the Laffer curve in economics. Uh, but more more importantly, um, actually. Tax revenues went up after the Donald Trump 2018 tax cuts um, in, in hard numbers. The Democrat response is, oh, well, the, actually, revenues would have went up even more um, if you didn't cut the – which disregards the Laffer curve, and that's all you know economic sort of 101 type stuff, notwithstanding the fact that here, here's the real truth. Okay, government tax revenues as a percentage of, and so you can throw out the hard numbers like 800 billion here. It's like that that actually isn't the right way to analyze a, a concept like this. The right way to do it is by looking at percentages of GDP. And if you look at the federal government tax revenues as a percentage of GDP, it's at a, it's at an all time record high. It actually doesn't change that much over time. You can change the rates and change the tax code a whole bunch, but the actual percentage of the GDP that the tax the federal government collects in tax revenues actually doesn't change much over time. It's around 17, 18% of GDP that the government collects in tax revenues. That doesn't really change much. And it actually, it's been gone, it's gone up since the 2018 tax cuts. So that's not what's driving the deficit. Actually, the entire deficit in debt is driven by increased spending on the federal government. And that's provable by looking at the percentage of GDP as tax revenues. And so when the federal government is consistently taking in a certain percentage of GDP as tax revenue, but the percentage of GDP that the government is spending is constantly increasing every year, that shows you indisputably that it is spending and spending alone that is driving the budget deficit. And so you're, the way you're looking at the the tax cut issue and the, and the deficit issue is, is completely wrong on that front. But uh, again, not that that point aside um i agree with you that it would be it would be nice if if not only trump but but lots of other republicans um would be a lot more aggressive on spending cuts um and, and trying to balance the budget um and, and so you know I, I like people always say well republicans ran deficits too and it's like yeah, and I agree, and that's bad, and they shouldn't do that. That's why. That's why there's rhinos. That's why the Tea Party happened. That's why there. That's why there's the 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 Matt Rosendale types in Congress that vote no against all of these bills, even with the threat of a shutdown. And frankly, we ought to have a government shutdown if they can't balance the budget and they can't secure the border. Because what the hell's the point of a federal government if it can't even secure the border? Okay, so the last shut it down. <laughs> The Laffer Curve is a model to try to get the most out of tax money. That we, There's no information that has been presented that I am aware of that, that shows that Trump, by decreasing the tax income, has found a better spot on the Laffer Curve to get more money tax per dollar. Tax revenues went up. No, tax revenues went can, up. We can directly correlate that to, towards uh, that 
decrease no, in taxes just... or through other increase because the economy and i know this upsets people but the economy was in an upward trajectory when donald trump took the administration so was it the tax cuts or was it the upward trajectory that it was already along it was a bunch of bunch of different things. It was okay, things. It, was, but, it, was, it was the totality of the circumstances. So you, so do you think that the eight hundred and fifty billion dollars in revenue that was lost was made up by increased growth? By increased, so you genuinely believe that? If that's the I, case, I don't, I don't. I think we just we're just gonna d disagree here. I haven't seen any data that's shown me or any data that exists that shows that to me well, you, well it, you're not going to get the data because you're trying to figure out what would the economy have done in a different situation that that's going to inherently involve speculation nobody knows nobody knows what yeah, the economy if, would have done see, without the 2018 tax cuts i i i understand that you cannot like have 90 percent, 80 percent tax rates but what we're talking about here there's loss of 850 billion trump did nothing to correct for that so if he did nothing to correct for that 850 billion loss hoping and that's what it was hoping because neither of us really know that it would just make up the difference through the magic of the laffer curve uh, we don't know and what's come out on the other at, at me being as as nice as possible we both don't know if we're just being as nice as possible look I, he should have cut spending let me be clear I agree. in another term in another term he will continue to try to cut taxes we agree on that right do we agree uh, that Trump will try we to cut taxes need, if he gets reelected? Well, it'll actually depend on Congress, and and that's the part will, of this will conversation we're missing. That's the question. Will he try to cut I think taxes? Depends, I, I think Donald Trump is a very practical. I don't think he's an ideologue. I don't think he really cares about policy all that much. I think he's more of a practical kind of guy. I think a lot of his policy choices are driven by what's going on in Congress. I think one of the reasons you saw him not focusing on trying to cut the deficit during his term and during his State of the Union is because he recognized uh, that Congress is totally out of control and, and the Democrats in Congress refuse to cut spending on anything. And so Trump Trump said, why, why would Trump come out and say, we really want to cut spending? when he knows that that's not going to happen and he knows that the democrats will never ever agree to even a dime in spending cuts and so but if if, if we have a, if we have cuts. a red wave if we have if we have a big red wave in 2024 and you've got a very very conservative congress with the with with uh with the matt gateses and the matt rosendales and, and those types of uh, people in, in Congress where they're actually passing budget bills where they massively, massively slash spending at the federal level. Absolutely, Trump will support that. He'll absolutely sign that. If we if we get Trump in the office and we end up with a rhino Congress or a Democrat Congress, then no, I don't think he's probably going to spend a lot of effort on it because he's a practical kind of guy and he knows it's a political impossibility because Congress is totally out of control. They're drunk. They're spending like drunken criminals. So... Trump isn't campaigning on this much, though, is he? That was a cut. No, again, and that, and I've been, I've been, I've been criticizing so Trump this since twenty seventeen for not for not focusing focusing more on the issue. So let's say I, I, as far as I'm aware, he is in favor of at least some tax cuts. I know he's, a, I mean, he's as a Republican, it's well, kind of hard to run for president and not be in favor of some tax cuts somewhere. I, well, actually, we the biggest. To, if we go to his biggest, website, we can find probably some tax. We're going to do this tax cut for working families, this tax cut for business, some tax cut for whatever. But the the biggest the biggest issue is making the 2018 tax cuts permanent, and that is that is the number one political goal. Okay. Of of but if we make right these now, tax because making those making those 2018 tax cuts per permanent is going to make a substantial personal financial difference in my life. I'm you're in a lot of other people's lives. You're looking at you're looking at potentially tens of thousands of dollars of increased taxes that we're going to be paying out of our pockets in 2025 if Donald Trump's 2018 tax cuts are not made permanent. So that is whether you can oh is it a tax cut to make the existing tax cuts permanent? Maybe maybe not, but that is a, a very important issue. Frankly, it's one of the most important political issues to me because whether or not the Trump tax cuts get made permanent and they automatically expire in 2025 because of the way the budget gimmicks have to work with the way that the Congress does things. Um, you're, I mean, the, me and a lot of other people are looking at having to pay tens of thousands of dollars of additional taxes, and so that is a big issue. Okay, so if Trump has the ability to do massive tax cuts probably will yes i would certainly hope so i mean we need to do you think he would uh, you said hope so do you think he would absolutely yeah okay absolutely so if he's given the opportunity if he does well this election he has the house has the senate 
does well and maybe he's not able to get everything he wants because there's people in there that are rhinos as in they disagree with him and he doesn't want you know he can't rally them so he well, does that's a not smaller, my definition of a rhino well that's well that's my definition of a rhino um if it's a smaller medium tax cut he does that he's not going to substantially decrease the size of the federal government to make up for those tax cuts or to make up for the the deficit that we have now he's not even if given the opportunity he's not you're, you're it depends it depends on the political situation it depends on congress well, you're talking well, about it, a, some attempt, hypothetical is there any attempt we could point towards where he was like we're gonna is he anything he's proposing anything he's moving towards because everything yeah. i see look at the budgets not, look at the budgets he proposed everything look at the budgets he proposed everything i he, see he everything i see of of the budgets uh, every everything i see from trump is not massive cuts to a point that it would make up for the 80 to 50 or the further tax cuts it's the taking over of said institutions or as you would say the cleaning of them of all the fucking corrupt swampy monster well, creatures if, yeah if if the choice is cleaning up swamp creatures or having joe biden in office again where he not only not is only is not wanting to cut taxes okay. mm -hmm. but he's he's wanting to increase spending uh, and increase taxes, which are going to destroy the economy, and we're going to end up in a in a horrible recession with a even a more bloated government, even more debt. It's going to be a disaster for the middle class and low income people. You realize low income people are the one, the poor people in our country are the ones getting screwed the most by this because of the massive debt causing slow GDP you mean the, you growth mean the rates, massive tax inflation, cuts? et cetera, et cetera. You mean the eight hundred fifty billion tax cuts getting reversed? They would be the ones hurt the most. Uh, poor people? Absolutely, yeah. I, th I think 85% of Americans uh, got a tax cut w under the 2018 tax cuts. The vast majority of, of the tax benefits did not go to poor people or even middle class people. Bro, how can you how can you give tax benefits to people that don't pay tax? You realize 50% of Americans pay zero in federal income taxes. You realize that, right? You would give so when you tax say, breaks you, to the people when you who say, pay taxes lecture. That's how it you, works. When, yes, when you cut taxes, you so cut taxes So the people who people pay, pay the taxes. most taxes, you could often give bigger tax breaks, yes? And that's As where what, the value numbers? of the tax breaks was concentrated. It was with the people who pay, you know, the bigger rich people. That's where it was concentrated. Yes, it's not. It's not no, no. It's not even rich people. It's can middle, we look it's at the, we can look people. up the numbers here? But the, I believe it was like eighty to eighty-five percent of got, the total value got a, of tax cuts that was cut was concentrated in either upper class to literally the top one percent business class of the United okay. States. Okay, when you've got somebody that's making a hundred million dollars a year and you take their tax rate from thirty-five percent to thirty-four percent, and then you've got somebody that makes. Thirty thousand dollars a year and I'm not zero arguing taxes. that there was and then no you cut tax taxes cuts for middle like, class people. Yeah. I'm not arguing oh, that there was oh, no oh. tax cuts for middle class people. I'm arguing that the majority of the value of those tax cuts were not directed towards working class or lower class people. It was directed towards people who are more well off and the rich, as they're traditionally referred to. That's where the majority I, I think, of the tax I, I, cuts I, I were concentrated. I, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. But I'm, 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 again, you, you can manipulate. You, I'm asking you, you can, to. I'm, you, you can say that's manipulate. I'm just saying something that. Tell me if it's wrong. Just tell me if it's wrong or true. Can you tell me that? I think it's the wrong way to look at it. I don't know if but it's is it wrong or true. If you can, if you can, if wrong, you can manipulate true. the statistics to come manipulate. up with that, you, know, you may be able to you manipulate. Be able. Okay, can, no. Okay, lecture. If you, I don't know if you believe in the flat tax or not. I don't know if you're one of those guys who believes in. Like I know a, that I'm. I know. I know that I'm middle class, and I know that I got a huge. huge I just. Tax I don't. Under, you could bite this bullet cuts. and then say I don't care. You could say, well, of course the rich are getting more tax cuts because they pay more in taxes, and if they add more to the economy, so of course. They I, don't be, the, I, I don't know the. I don't know the answer. If you want, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. All I do know is that 85% of Americans experienced a tax cut. I know that it was a huge impact on me. I know that it made virtually no so, difference to the percentage of GDP that the federal government collects in tax revenues. I know that it was a massive boost to, to GDP. 850 billion dollars. 850 billion dollars. And you don't wait. You said you know that it was a massive you, you, bo boost to GDP growth. How do you know that? Uh, because uh, you look at GDP growth rates under Trump. Like, that's not proof that it was caused by the tax cuts. We talked about this before, but if you look at GDP growth rates, they were already going up from Obama transitioning to Trump, and before 2017, they were continuing to go up. In 2018, when the tax cuts were introduced, was there a massive spike in GDP growth? No, our, our GDP growth has been shit for a long time because of the overbearing federal debt, honestly. The, the bigger the federal debt, the lower the GDP growth well, rate. Let me just, that's in 2018 that's established. or 2019, you, you agree. was there a, a you, spike in GDP growth from the tax cut? I have no idea. I have no, I have no, so how do you, how do you say you know this it, if you don't know? 
because I know that injecting that much, dude, it's like, you're, are you a Keynesian? Like, if you're a Keynesian, you can't deny that injecting $850 billion into the economy doesn't No, no, doesn't I'm not arguing that it can't have an impact on the GDP. I'm arguing that I have no clue if it made – in fact, I don't believe that it made up the majority. Like, I, I can – like, yeah. if I cut $850 billion taxes, I acknowledge that there will be some more money in some capacity flowing in through increased government like economic you. activity. You have, not, you have but, to as a Keynesian. But if I you cut $850 billion, and I get a hundred billion back in increased revenue, then I'm out seven hundred fifty billion, and I didn't accomplish bringing down my deficit. I accomplished the opposite. You're not you're you're not out anything because the federal government took in more in revenues after the 2018 tax cuts. That's what you're not understanding. You keep saying, "Oh, they lost eight hundred fifty billion. No, look at the actual revenue you, numbers. They I'm, increased their revenues after the 2018 tax cuts. We already said we're going in a circle. So you but just here, told me that you don't know if there was a GDP increase from the taxes. I was going to answer that. Let, okay, well. And here's here, here's why. Here's why I was going to say this. Okay, mm -hmm. because it's very it's very very difficult to increase the GDP growth rate in the United States right now, regardless of policy or anything else, because of the overbearing federal debt and the the economic economic studies are consistent it's undisputed the larger the federal debt as a percentage of gdp the lower your gdp growth rate and so our gdp growth rate is very very slow and stagnant and one percent if we're lucky two percent maybe if you're lucky because of this overbearing federal debt that's the fault of both parties i will readily admit um and, and so when you talk about well the, the gdp growth rate drastically increased after the 2018 tax it's like you're never going to see that because we've got such a massive all? federal debt that it's dragged our gdp growth rate down and it can't go up dude i i just think that this is i mean i understand that you cannot tax something to 80 to 90 percent but the assumption being made here i don't think has been sufficiently proven and if we have and under trump the deficit increased the record numbers and i do think the tax cuts played a role in it if you're decreasing the revenue that your government's taking in during a term and it just so happens to be the same term that you have the highest deficit didn't of any decrease president revenues. on record, revenues went up on revenues record. went highest up. highest deficit of Quit any president that. on record. Donald J. Trump. I'm put those on signs, on posters, Quit. put them you're, on you're putting billboards. Out lies. He's the deficit president. Donald J. Trump is the deficit president. By the way, Joe Biden's GDP growth rates are higher. Since when do Democrats care about the deficit? Uh, I mean, it's just so rich. But I just talked but to honestly, you earlier about why I cared about the deficit, and I gave you an honest answer. But uh, Joe Biden's GDP growth rates are higher. And he didn't do massive tax cuts, by the way, in those ways. He did some tax cuts, tax credits mostly. Bro, bro, just would you please stop spreading misinformation? Well, the GDP that growth rates reven higher? Revenues went down. Government revenues went up after the 2018 remember tax Remember when cuts. Trump was Look blagging up, about those black so you, unemployment rates? You know they're even lower under I remember, Biden. Isn't I re that fantastic? When you were, I remember when you were spreading misinformation 20 seconds ago saying that government revenues went down after the 2018 tax cuts, which is false information. I remember that. I did, I did, when did I say government revenues went you down? I said, said it. it didn't make up you for the tax said cuts. It. You I just said I don't said think it made up for the tax cuts. Ago. I said I don't think it made it made up for the tax cuts. That doesn't mean First government all, revenues no. went down. But by the way, I we for example they went I, up. government I, revenues no, 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 went wait, up. Wait, wait, let me ask you a question. If I am running a Bed Bath and Beyond, right, and I invest a bunch of money into bed into beds, right, but very uh, a bunch of money in the beds and very little money into Bath or B Beyond, I guess, uh, and I'm making all my money on Beyond and all my money on you know uh, Bath, but none of my money in bed. That doesn't mean that investing into bed is what brought me all that profit. So you haven't substantiated to me that it was these deficit cuts that brought in all this new government revenue that increased this. By the way, again, you can say that the revenue increased, the deficit increased to record highs under Trump. So of course, yeah, the because of increased. COVID, yeah, not it's not just because of COVID. I think that the but look, we've been talking about the deficit for a while. We can move on if you want, about, or we could just wrap it been, up. We, I think we've been talking for almost two hours it, here. So. Almost two hours. Let's try to get it over to two hour mark. Can we do that? Is, That's... There, a time, is there a timer on this? I'm trying um, to figure out if there's a timer on our call. We've been I talking. I have a, I, we, I started the stream with this. So we've been talking about an hour 40. Okay. I'm down to, I, I, I need to take a break. So I'm down to call it. Um, I did enjoy the conversation though. Um, I do have more to say on, on all of these issues. And I'm sure we could talk about other political issues. I hope Danabo is happy. I, I think so. I think so. He said with, he. I, I remember he wanted it to be regular, or you said it was something about right. Do you want this to be regular every few weeks or something? I think that's too often. I do think it'd be cool to do it every month, maybe. Every month's fine. Month. I'm fine with that.
Um, I think it'd be cool to do is uh, throughout the election or throughout the campaign. Okay, we once can, a month is fine with me. And and every 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 month I'm going to come back on and I'm going to be, bro. Please please tell me you finally realize that you should not be supporting Joe Biden. Well, every time I'm going to tell you you cut me and I bleed blue. <laughs> All right. Okay. You have a good um, one, man. Hey. Yeah. You too. Thanks. Yep. Bye bye.